June. I should be the one going out there, not you. I grit my teeth and try not to look at Thomas. His words could have come right out of Matthias' mouth. I'll look less suspicious than you, I reply. People may find it easier to trust me. We're standing in front of a window at Batala Hall's north wing, watching Commander Jameson at work on the other side of the glass. Today, they caught a spy from the colonies who was secretly spreading propaganda about how the Republic is lying to you. Spies are usually shipped out to Denver, but if they're caught in a big city like Los Angeles, we take them before the Capitol does. He's dangling upside down in the interrogation room right now. Commander Jameson has a pair of scissors in her hand. I tilt my head a little as I look at the spy. I already hate him as much as I hate anything about the colonies. He's not affiliated with the Patriots, that's for sure, but that just makes him more of a coward. So far, every Patriot we've hunt hunted down has killed himself before getting taken in. This spy's young, probably in his late 20s, about the same age as my brother was. I'm getting slowly, I'm slowly growing used to talking about Matthias in the past sense. From the corner of my eye, I can see that Thomas is still looking at me. Commander Jameson officially promoted him to fill my brother's position, but Thomas has little power over what I choose to do on this test mission, and it drives him crazy. He would have balked at letting me go undercover in the lake sector for days on end without a pair of strong backups and a team to follow me. But it's going to happen anyway, starting tomorrow morning. Look, don't worry about me. Through the glass, I see the spy arch is back in agony. I can take care of myself. Day isn't a fool. If I have a team following me through the city, he'll notice it in no time. Thomas turns back to the interrogation. I know you're good at what you do, he replies. I wait for the but in his sentence. It doesn't come. Just keep your microphone on. I'll take care of things back here. I smile at him. Thanks. He doesn't look back at me, but I can see his lips tilt up at the edges. Maybe he's remembering when I used to tag along after him and Matthias, asking them inane questions about how the military worked. Behind the glass, the spy suddenly yells something at Commander Jameson and thrashes violently against his chains. She glances over at us and motions us in with a flip of her hand. I don't hesitate. Thomas and I, and another soldier standing close to the interrogation room's door, hurry inside and spread out near the back wall. Instantly, I feel how stuffy and hot the room is. I look on as the prisoner continues to scream. What did you say to him? I ask Commander Jameson. She looks at me. Her eyes are ice cold. I told him that our airships will target his hometown next. She turns back to the prisoner. He'll start cooperating if he knows what's good for him. The spy glares at each of us in turn. Blood runs from his mouth to his forehead and hair and drips onto the floor beneath him. Whenever he thrashes, Commander Jameson stomps on the chain around his neck and chokes him until he stops. Now he snarls and spits blood at our boots making me wipe mine against the ground in disgust. Commander Jameson bends down and smiles at him. Let's start again, shall we? What's your name? The spy looks away from her and says nothing. Commander Jameson sighs and nods to Thomas. My hands are tired, she says. You do the honors. Yes, ma'am. Thomas salutes and steps forward. He tightens his jaw, then balls up his fist and punches the spy hard in the stomach. The spy's eyes bulge out, and he coughs up more blood onto the floor. I distract myself by studying the details of his outfit. Brass buttons, military boots, a blue pin on his sleeve. Which means he had disguised himself as a soldier, and we caught him near San Diego, the only city that requires everyone to wear those blue pins. I can tell what gave him away, too. One of the brass buttons looks slightly fatter than those made in the Republic. He must have stitched on that button by himself a button from an old colony's uniform. Stupid. A mistake only a colony spy would make. What's your name? Commander Jameson asks him again. Thomas flips open a knife and grabs one of the spy's fingers. The spy swallows hard. Emerson. Emerson what? Be specific. Emerson Adam Graham. Mr. Emerson Adam Graham of East Texas? Commander Jameson says it light in a coaxing voice. A pleasure to meet you, young sir. Tell me, Mr. Graham, why did the colonies send you over to our fine republic? To spread their lies? The spy lets out a weak laugh. Fine republic, he snaps. Your republic won't last another decade, and all the better, too. Once the colonies take over your land, 
They'll make better use of it than you have. Thomas hits the spy across the face with the hilt of his knife. A tooth slids across the floor. When I look back at Thomas, his hair has fallen out across his face and a cruel pleasure has replaced his usual kindness. I frown. I haven't seen this look on Thomas's face often. It chills me. Commander Jameson stops him before he can hit the spy again. It's all right. Let us hear what our friend has to say against the Republic. The spy's face is scarlet from hanging upside down for so long. You call this a Republic? You kill your own people and torture those who used to be your brothers? I roll my eyes at that. The colonies want us to think that letting them take over is a good thing, like they're annexing us or doing us some kind of favor. That's how they see us, a poor little fringe nation, as if they're the more powerful one. That idea is their best in is in their best interest, after all, since I hear the floods have claimed much more of their land than ours. That's all it's ever been about, land, land, land. But becoming a union? That has never happened. And that will never happen. We'll defeat them first or die trying. I'll tell you nothing. You can try as hard as you want, but I'll tell you nothing. Commander Jameson smiles at Thomas, who smiles back. Well, you heard Mr. Graham, she says. Try as hard as you want. Thomas goes to work on him. And after a while, the other soldier in the room has to join him to hold the spy in place. I force myself to look on as they try to pry information out of him. I need to learn this, to familiarize myself with this. My ears ring from the spy's screams. I ignore the fact that the spy's hair is straight and dark like my own, and his skin is pale, and his youth reminds me of Matthias all over again. I tell myself that Matthias is not the one whom Thomas is now torturing. That would be impossible. Matthias can't be tortured. He is already dead. That night, Thomas escorts me back to my apartment and kisses me on the cheek before he leaves. He tells me to be careful and that he will be monitoring anything that transmits through my microphone. Everyone will keep an eye on you, he reassures me. You're not alone out there unless you choose to be. I manage to smile back. I ask him to take care of Ollie while I'm gone. When I'm finally back inside the apartment, I curl up on the couch and rest my arm on Ollie's back. He's sleeping soundly, but has pressed himself tightly against the side of the couch. He probably feels Matthias' absence as much as I do. On the coffee table, stacks of her old parents' old photos from Matthias' bedroom closet are strewn across the glass. So are Matthias' journals and a booklet where he used to save little mementos of the things we did together, an opera, late-night dinners, early practices at the track. I've been looking through them ever since Thomas left, hoping that the thing Matthias had wanted to talk to me about is mentioned somewhere. I flip through Matthias' writing and reread the little notes Dad liked to leave on the bottom of their photos. The most recent one shows our parents standing with a young Matthias in front of Batala Hall. All three are making thumbs-up gestures. Matthias' future career is here, March 12th. I stare at the date. It was taken several weeks before they died. My recorder sits on the edge of the coffee table. I snap my fingers twice, then listen to Day's voice over and over. What face matches up to this voice? I try to imagine how Day looks, young and athletic probably, and lean from years on the streets. The voice sounds so crackled and distorted from the speakers that there are parts I can't understand. Hear that, Ollie? I whisper. Ollie snores a little and rubs his head against my hand. That's our guy, and I'm going to get him. I fall asleep with Day's words ringing in my ears. 0625 hours. I'm in the lake sector, watching the strengthening daylight paint the churning water wheels and turbines gold. A layer of smoke hovers perpetually over the water's edge. Farther across the lake, I can see downtown Los Angeles sitting right next to the shore. A street policeman approaches and tells me to stop loitering, keep moving. I nod wordlessly and continue along the shore. From a distance, I blend in completely with those walking around me. My half sleeve collared shirt came from a thrift emporium at the border between lake and winter. My trousers are torn and smeared with dirt. My boots' leather is flaking off. I'm very careful about the type of knot I use to tie my shoelaces. It's a simple rose knot, something any worker would use. I've pulled my hair back into a tight, high ponytail. I wear a newsboy cap over it. Day's pendant necklace sits snugly in my pocket. 
I can't believe how filthy the streets are here. Probably even worse than the dilapidated outskirts of Los Angeles. The ground sits low against the water, not unlike the other poor sectors, which all seem to look the same, so that whenever there's a storm, the lake probably floods all the streets lining the shore with dirty sewage water, sewage contaminated water. Every building is faded, crumbling, and pockmarked, except, of course, the police headquarters. People walk around trash piled against the walls as if it isn't even there. Flies and stray dogs linger near the garbage, as do some people. I crinkle my nose at the smell. Smoky lanterns, grease, sewage. Then I stop, realizing that if I'm to pass as a lake citizen, I should pretend to be used, at, used to the stench. Several men grin at me as I pass by. One even calls out to me. I ignore them and keep going. What a bunch of cons. Men who barely pass their trials. I wonder if I can catch the plague from these people, even though I'm vaccinated. Who knows where they've been? Then I stop myself. Matthias had told me never to judge the poor like that. Well, he's a better person than I am, I think bitterly. The tiny microphone inside my cheek vibrates a little. Then a faint sound comes from my earpiece. Ms. I. Paris, Thomas's voice comes out as a tinny hum that I can only hear. Only I can hear. Everything working? Yep, I murmur. The little microphone picks up my throat's vibrations. In Central Lake now. I'm going dark for a bit. Got it, Thomas says, and his side falls silent. I make a clinking sound with my clicking sound with my tongue to turn off my microphone. I spend most of the first morning pretending to dig around in the garbage bins. From the other beggars, I hear stories about plague victims, which areas the police are seem most nervous about, and which have started to recover. They talk about the best places to find food, the best places to find fresh water, the best places to hide during hurricanes. Some of the beggars look too young to have ever taken the trial. The youngest ones talk about their parents or how to pickpocket a soldier. But no one talks about day. The hours drag on into evening, then night. When I find a quiet alley to rest in, and with a few other beggars already asleep in the garbage bins, I curl into a dark corner and click my microphone on. Then I take out Day's pendant necklace from my pocket, holding it up slightly so I can study its smooth bumps. Calling it a night, I murmur. My throat barely vibrates. My hearing piece crackles faintly with, a st with static. Ms. I. Paris, Thomas says. Any luck today? Nope, no luck. I'll try some public places tomorrow. Okay, we'll have people over here 24-7. By people over here 24-7, I know Thomas means he's the only one there listening for me. Thanks, I whisper. Going dark. I click my microphone off. My stomach rumbles. I pull out a slice of chicken I found in the back of a cafe's kitchen and force myself to munch on it, ignoring the slime of cold grease. If I need to live like a lake citizen, I'll have to eat like one. Maybe I should get a job, I think. The idea makes me snort a little. When I finally fall asleep, I have a bad dream, and Matthias is in it. I find nothing substantial the next day, or the day after that, my hair grows tangled and dull in the heat and smoke, and dirt has started to coat my face. When I look at my reflection in the lake, I realize that I look exactly like a street beggar now. Everything feels dirty. On the fourth day, I make my way to the rim of the lake and Blue Ridge and decide to spend some time wandering through the bars. That's when something happens. I stumble into a skiz fight. Day the rules for watching and betting on a skiz fight are simple enough. 1. You pick who you think will win. 2. You bet on that person. That's about it. The only problem that comes is when you're too infamous to risk placing a public bet and possibly getting picked up by the police. This afternoon, I'm crouched behind the chimney of a crumbling one-story warehouse. From here, I can see the crowd of people gathered in the abandoned building next door. I'm even close enough to make out some of their conversations. And Tess. Tess is down there with them, her delicate frame nearly lost in the shuffle, with a pouch of our money and a smile on her face. I watch as she listens to the other gamblers discuss the fighters. She asks them a few questions of her own. I don't dare take my eyes off her. Street police, who are unhappy with their bribes, sometimes break up skiz fights, arresting people as they go, and as a result, 
I never stand with the crowd when Tess and I watch the fights. If they catch me and fingerprint me, it's over for both of us. Tess, though, is slender and wily. She can escape a raid much more easily than I can. But that doesn't mean I'll leave her on her own. Keep moving, cousin, I mutter under my breath as Tess stops to laugh at some young gambler's joke. Don't get too close to her, you trot. A noise comes from one end of the crowd. My eyes flick there for a second. One of the fighters is stirring up the onlookers by waving her arms and yelling. I smile. That girl is named Cade, or so the crowd's chant tells me. Cade is the very same bartender I met days ago while passing through the Alta sector. She flexes her wrists, then bounces on her feet and shakes out her arms. Cade has already won a match. Going by the unspoken rules of skiz, she must now fight until she loses a round, until her opponent throws her to the ground. Each time she wins, she gets a cut on the cut of the overall uh, bet on her opponent. My eyes wander to the girl she just picked out to be her next challenger. The girl is olive-skinned, with furrowed brows and an uncertain expression. I roll my eyes. Surely the crowd must know that this fight's going to be a no-brainer. This challenger will be lucky if Cade lets her live. Tess waits for a moment when no one is paying attention to her, then glances up quickly in my direction. I hold up one finger. She grins, then winks at me and looks back to the crowd. She hands money to the person organizing bets, a big burly guy. We've cast 1,000 notes, almost all our money, in favor of Cade. The fight lasts for less than a minute. Cade strikes early and hard, lunging out and striking the other girl viciously across the face. The other girl wavers. Cade toys with her cat like toys with her like a cat playing with her food before lashing out again with her fist. The challenger crashes to the ground, hitting her head on the cement floor, where she lies in a daze. Knockout. The crowd cheers, and several people help the girl stumble out of the ring. I exchange a brief smile with Tess, who gathers up our winnings and stuffs it into the pouch. 1,500 notes. I swallow hard, warning myself not to get too excited, one step closer to a vial of cure. My attention is back on the cheering crowd. Cade flips her hair at the audience and strikes a mock pose for them, which makes them go wild. Who's next? The crowd chants back. Choose! Choose! Cade looks slowly around the circle, shaking her head and sometimes tilting it to one side. I keep my eyes on Tess. She stands on her tiptoes behind several taller people, straining for a good look. Then she taps them hesitantly on their shoulders, says something, and pushes her way forward. I tighten my jaw at the sight. Next time I'll join her. Then she can sit on my shoulders and finally get to see the fights instead of calling unwanted attention to herself. A second later, I bolt upright. Tess has pushed her way past one of the larger gamblers. He shouts something at her, something angry, and before Tess can apologize, I see him shove her roughly into the ring center. She stumbles, and the crowd roars with laughter. Anger boils up in my chest. Cade seems amused by the whole thing. Is that a challenge, kid? She shouts. A grin breaks out on her face. You look like fun. Tess looks around, bewildered. She tries to take a step back into the crowd, but they block her path. When I see Cade nod her head in Tess's direction... I rise up from my crouch. This trot's going to choose Tess. Oh, hell no. Not while I'm watching. Not if Cade wants to live. Suddenly, a voice rings out from below. I pause. Some girl has made her way to the front of the ring, where she stares at Cade. She rolls her eyes. Doesn't seem like a fair fight, she calls out. Cade laughs. There's a brief silence. Then, Cade shouts back, Who the hell you think you are talking to me like that? Think you're better? She points at the girl, and the crowd lets out a cheer. I see Tess scurry into the safety of the crowd. This new girl has taken Tess's place, whether she meant to or not. I let out a long breath. When I've managed to calm down, I take a closer look at Cade's new opponent. She's not much taller than Tess, and definitely lighter than Cade. For a second, it seems like the crowd's attention has made her uncomfortable, and I'm ready to dismiss her as a real contender until I study her again. No. This girl's nothing like the last one. She's hesitating, not because she's afraid to fight or because she fears losing, but because she's thinking, calculating. She has dark hair tied back in a high ponytail and a lean, athletic build. She stands deliberately, with a hand resting on her hip 
as if nothing in the world can catch her off guard. I find myself pausing to admire her face. For a brief moment, I'm lost to my surroundings. The girl shakes her head at Cade. This surprises me too. I've never seen anyone refuse to fight. Everyone knows the rules. If you're chosen, you fight. This girl doesn't seem to fear the crowd's wrath. Cade laughs at her the way and says something I can't quite make out. Tess hears it, though, and casts me a quick, concerned glance. This time the girl nods. The crowd lets out another cheer, and Cade smiles. I lean a little bit out from behind the chimney. Something about this girl. I don't know what it is, but her eyes burn in the light, and although it's hot and might be my imagination, I think I see a small smile on the girl's face. Tess shoots a questioning look at me. I hesitate for a split second, then hold up one finger again. I'm grateful to this mystery girl for helping Tess out, but with my money on the line, I decide to play it safe. Tess nods, then casts our bet in favor of Kate. But the instant the new girl steps into the circle and I see her stance, I know I've made a big mistake. Kate strikes like a bull, a battering ram. This girl strikes like a viper. June I'm not worried about losing this fight. I'm more worried that I'll accidentally kill my opponent. If I run right now, though, I'm a dead girl. I silently scold myself. What a game to involve myself in. When I first saw this crowd of gamblers, I'd wanted to leave it alone. I'd wanted nothing to do with brawls. Not a good place to get caught by street police and taken downtown for questioning. But then, I thought that maybe I could pick up some valuable information from a group like this. So many locals, some who might even know Day personally. Surely Day isn't a complete stranger to everyone in Lake. And if anyone knows who he is, it's the crowd that watches illegal skiz fights. But I should have not have said anything about the skinny girl they shoved into the ring. I should have let her fend for herself. It's too late now. The girl named Cade tilts her head at me and grins as we face each other in the ring. I take a deep breath. Already she has started to circle me, stalking me like prey. I study her, study her stance. She steps forward with her right foot. She's left-handed. Usually, this would work to her advantage and throw off her opponents, but I've trained for this. I shift the way I walk. My ears are drowning in the noise. I let her strike first. She bares her teeth at me and lunges forward at full speed, her fist raised, but I can see her preparing to kick. I sidestep. Her kick swooshes past me. I use her momentum against her and strike her hard when her back's turned. She loses her balance and nearly falls. The crowd cheers. Cade whirls around to face me again. This time her smile's gone. I've succeeded in angering her. She lunges at me again. I block her first two punches, but her third punch catches me across the jaw and makes my head spin. Every muscle in my body wants to end this now, but I force my temper down. If I fight too well, people might get suspicious. My style is too precise for a simple street beggar. I let Cade hit me one last time. The crowd roars. She smiles, starts smiling again, her confidence returning. I wait until she's ready to charge. Then I dart forward, duck down, and trip her. She doesn't see it coming. She falls heavily onto her back. The crowd screams in approval. Cade forces herself onto her feet, even though most giz fights would have called her, called her fall the end of the round. She wipes a bit of blood from her mouth. Before she can even catch her breath properly, she lets out an angry shout and lunges for me again. I should have seen the tiny flash of light near her wrist. Cade's fist punches hard into my side, and I feel a terrible sharp pain. I shove her away. She winks at me and starts circling again. I hold my side. And that's when I feel something warm and wet at my waist. I look down. A stab wound. Only a serrated knife could have torn my skin that way. I narrow my eyes at Cade. Weapons are not supposed to be a part of a skiz fight, but this is hardly a fight where the crowd follows all rules. The pain makes me lightheaded and angry. No rules? So be it. When Cade comes at me again, I dart away and twist her arm in a tight hold. In one move, I shatter it. She screams in pain. When she tries to pull away, I continue to hold on, twisting the broken arm behind her back until I see the blood drain from her face. A knife slips out from the bottom of her tank top and clatters to the ground. 
a serrated knife, just as I thought. Kate is not a normal street beggar. She has the skills to get her hands on a nice weapon like that, which means she might be in the same line of business as Day. If I were an undercover, I'd arrest her right now and take her in for questioning. My wound burns, but I grit my teeth and maintain my grip on her arm. Finally, Cade taps me frantically with her other hand. I release her. She collapses to the ground on her knees and her good arm. The crowd goes nuts. I clutch my bleeding side as tightly as I can, and when I look around, I see money exchanging hands. Two people help Cade out of the ring. She shoots me a look of hatred before she turns away, and the rest of the onlookers start up their chant. Choose! 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 Maybe it's the dizzying pain from my wound that makes me reckless. I can't contain my anger anymore. I turn without a word, roll my shirtless shirt sleeves back up to my elbows, and flip my collar up. Then I step out of the ring and start shoving my way out of the circle. The crowd's chant changes. I hear the boos start. I'm tempted to click my microphone on and tell Thomas to send soldiers, but I keep silent. I'd promised myself not to call for backup unless I had no choice, and I'm certainly not going to ruin my cover over a street brawl. When I've managed to walk outside the building, I take a risk to look behind me. Half a dozen of the onlookers are following me, and most of them enraged. They're the gamblers, I think, the ones who care the most. I ignore them and continue to walk. Get back here, one of them yells. You can't just leave like that. I break into a run. Curse this knife wound. I reach a large trash bin, trash bin and swing myself up onto it, then get ready to jump to a second floor window sill. If I can climb high enough, they won't be able to catch me. I leap as far as I can and manage to grab the edge of the window sill with one hand. But my wound has slowed me down. Someone grabs my leg and yanks hard. I lose my grip, scrape myself against the wall, and crash to the ground. I hit my head hard enough to send the world spinning. Then, they are on me, dragging me to my feet and back to the screaming crowd. I fight to clear my head. Spots explode across my vision. I try to click my microphone on, but my tongue feels slow and covered with sand. Thomas, I whisper, but it comes out as Matthias. I blindly reach out my hand for my brother, and then I remember that he's no longer there to take it. Suddenly, I hear a pop and a few shrieks, and in the next instant, they release me. I fall back to the ground. I try scrambling to my feet, but I stumble and fall again. Where did all this dust come from? I squint, trying to see through it. I can still hear the noise and chaos from the onlookers. Someone must have just set off a dust bomb. Then there's a voice telling me to get up. When I look to my side, I see a boy holding out his hand to me. He has bright blue eyes, dirt on his face, and a beat-up old cap on. And at this moment, I think he might be the most beautiful boy I've ever seen. Come on, he urges. I take his hand. In the dust and chaos, we hurry down the street and disappear into the afternoon's lengthening shadows. Day She won't tell me her name. I can understand that well enough. Lots of kids on the streets of Lake try to keep their identities a secret, especially after participating in something illegal like a skiz fight. Besides, I don't want to know her name. I'm still upset about losing the bet. Cade's defeat cost me a thousand notes. That was money toward a vial of cure. Time is running out, and it's all this girl's fault. Stupid me. If she hadn't been responsible for getting Tess out of the ring, I would have left her to fend for herself. But I know Tess would have given me sad puppy eyes for the rest of the day, so I didn't. Tess continues to ask questions as she helps the girl. That's what I'll call her, I guess. Clean the wound in her side as best I can. I stay quiet for the most part. I'm on guard. After the skiz fight and my dust bomb, the three of us ended up camping out on the balcony of an old library. Does it still count as a balcony if the whole wall has collapsed and left this floor open to the air? In fact, almost all the floors have collapsed walls. The library is part of an ancient high-rise that now lies almost entirely in the water several hundred feet from the lake's eastern edge, completely overgrown with wild grasses. It's a good place for people like us to find some shelter. I watch the streets along the banks for angry gamblers who might be still searching for the girl. I look over my shoulder from where I sit on the balcony's edge. 
The girl says something to Tess, and Tess smiles cautiously in return. My name's Tess, I hear her say. She knows better, better than to say mine, but she keeps on talking. What part of Lake are you from? Are you from another sector? She studies the girl's wound. That's a nasty one, but nothing that can't heal. I'll try to get some goat milk for you in the morning. It's good for you. Until then, you'll just have to spit on it. It'll help with infections. I can tell from the girl's face that she knows this already. Thank you, she murmurs to Tess. She glances in my direction. I'm grateful for your help. Tess smiles again, but I can tell that even she feels a little uncomfortable with this newcomer. I'm grateful for yours. I tighten my jaw. Night will fall in about an hour or so, and I have a wounded stranger added to my duties. After a while, I rise and join Tess and the girl. Somewhere in the distance, the Republic's pledge has started blaring from the city's speakers. We'll stay here for the night, I look at the girl. How are you feeling? Okay, she replies, but it's obvious she's in pain. She doesn't know what to do with her hands, so she just keeps reaching for her wound, then stopping herself. I have a sudden urge to comfort her. Why did you save me? She asks. I snored. No gaudy clue. You cost me a thousand notes. The girl smiles for the first time, but there's something eternally cautious about her eyes. She seems to take in and analyze my every word. She doesn't trust me. You bet big, don't you? Sorry about that. She made me angry, she shifts. I'm guessing Cade was no friend of yours? She's a bartender from the rim of Alta and Winter. Just a recent acquaintance. Tess laughs and gives me a look that I can't quite read. He likes to be acquainted with cute girls. I scowl at her. Bite your tongue, cousin. Haven't you had enough brushes with death for one day? Tess nods and a small smile on her face. I'll go get some water. She jumps up and heads to the open stairwell to the water's edge. When she's gone, I sit down next to the girl, and my hand accidentally brushes past her waist. She takes a small breath. I move away, afraid that I've hurt her. That should heal soon, if it doesn't get infected, but you might want to rest a couple of days. You can stay with us. The girl shrugs. Thanks. When I feel better, I'm tracking Cade down. I lean back and study the girl's face. She's a little paler than the other girls I see in the sector, and has large, dark eyes that shine with flecks of gold in the waning light. I can't tell what she is, which isn't unusual around here. Native, maybe, or Caucasian, or something. She's pretty in a way that distracts me, just like she did in the skiz ring. No, pretty's not the right word. Beautiful. And not only that, but she reminds me of someone. Maybe it's the expression in her eyes, something at once coolly logical and fiercely defiant. I feel my cheeks growing warm and suddenly look away, glad for the coming darkness. Maybe I shouldn't have helped her. Way too distracting. At this moment, all I'm thinking about is what I'd give her, give up for the chance to kiss her or run my fingers through her dark hair. So, girl, I say after a while. Thanks for your help today. For, you know, for Tess, I mean. Where'd you learn to fight like that? You broke Cade's arm without even trying. The girl hesitates. From the corner of my eye, I can see her watching me. I turn to face her, and she pretends to study the water instead, as if embarrassed to be caught looking. She absently touches her side and then makes a clicking sound with her tongue as if, it's out, of, as if out of habit. I hang around the edge of Batala a lot. I like to watch the cadets practice. Wow, you're a risk taker, but your fighting is pretty impressive. I bet you don't have much trouble on your own, the girl laughs. You can see how well I did on my own today, she shakes her head. Her long ponytail swings behind. I shouldn't have watched the skiz fight at all, but what can I say? Your friend looked like she could use some help. Then she shifts her gaze to me. That cautious expression still blankets her eyes. What about you? Were you in the crowd? Now, uh, Tess was down there because she likes seeing the action, and she's a little nearsighted. I like watching from a distance. Tess, is she your younger sister? I hesitate. Yeah, close enough. It was really Tess I wanted to keep safe with my dust bomb, you know. The girl raises an eyebrow at me. 
I watch her lips as they curl into a smile. You're so kind, she says. And does everyone around here know how to make a dust bomb? I wave my hand dismissively. Oh, sure. Even kids. It's easy. I look at her. You're not from the lake sector, are you? The girl shakes her head. Tangashi sector. I mean, I used to live there. Tangashi is pretty far away. You came all this way to see a skiz fight? Of course not. The girl leans back and carefully lies down. I can see the center of her bandage turning a dark red. I scavenge on the streets. I end up traveling a lot. Lake isn't safe right now, I say. A splash of turquoise in the corner of the balcony catches my eye. There's a small patch of sea daisies growing from a crack on the floor. Mom's favorite. You might catch the plague down here. The girl smiles at me, as if she already knows something I don't. I wish I could figure out who she reminds me of. Don't worry, she says. I'm a careful girl when I'm not angry. When evening finally comes and the girl has dozed off into a fitful sleep, I ask Tess to stay with her so I can sneak away to check on my family. Tess is happy to do it. Going to the plague-infected areas of Lake makes her nervous, and she always comes back scratching at her arms, as if she can feel an infection spreading on her skin. I tuck a handful of sea daisies into the sleeve of my shirt and a couple of notes into my pocket for good measure. Tess helps me wrap both of my hands in cloth before I go to avoid leaving fingerprints anywhere. The night feels surprisingly cool. No plague patrols wander the streets, and the only sounds come from the occasional cars and the distant blare of Jumbotron ads. The strange X on our door is still there, as prominent as ever. In fact, I'm almost certain that the soldiers have been back at least once, because the X is bright and the paint's fresh. They must have run a second check through the area. Whatever made them mark our door in the first place has apparently stuck around. I wait in the shadows near my mother's house, close enough so that I can actually peek through the gaps in our backyard's rickety fence. When I'm sure that no one is patrolling the street, I dart through the shadows toward the house and crawl to a broken board that leads onto the porch. I slide the board aside, then I crawl into the dark, stale-smelling crevice and pull the board back into place behind me. Small slivers of light come from between the floorboards and the rooms above me. I can hear my mother's voice toward the back, where our one bedroom is. I make my way over there, then crouch beside the bedroom's vent and look in. John is sitting on the edge of the bed with his arms crossed. His posture tells me that he's exhausted. His shoes are caked with dirt. I know Mom must have scolded him about that. John is looking toward the other side of the bedroom, where Mom must be standing. I hear her voice again, this time loud enough to understand. Neither of us is sick yet, she says. John looks away and back toward the bed. It doesn't seem to be contagious, and yet, Eden's skin still looks good. No bleeding. Not yet, John replies. We have to brace ourselves for the worst, Mom. In case Eden... Mom's voice is firm. I won't have you saying that in my house, John. He needs more than suppressants. Whoever gave them to us is very kind, but it's not enough. John shakes his head and gets up. Even now, especially now. He has to protect my mother from the truth of my whereabouts. When he moves away from the bed, I can see that Aiden is, Eden is lying there with a blanket pulled up to his chin, despite the heat. His skin looks oily with sweat. The color of it is strange, too, a pale, sickly green. I don't remember other plagues with symptoms like that. A lump rises in my throat. The bedroom looks exactly the same. The few things in it, old and worn, but still comfortable, there's the tattered mattress Eden's on, and next to it is the scratched-up chest of drawers that I used to doodle on. There's our obligatory portrait of the lector hanging on the wall, surrounded by a handful of our own photos, as if he were a member of our family. That's all our bedroom has. When Eden was a toddler, John and I used to hold up his hands and help him walk from one end of this room to the other. John would give him high fives whenever he did it on his own. Now, I see Mom's shadow stop in the middle of the room. She doesn't say anything. I imagine her hunched shoulders, her head in her hands, her brave face finally gone. John sighs. Footsteps echo above me, and I know he must, he must have crossed the room to hug her. Eden will be okay. Maybe this virus is less dangerous, and he'll recover on his own. There's a pause. I'm going to see what we have for soup. I hear him leave the bedroom. I'm sure John hated working at the steam plant, but 
At least he got to leave the house and take his mind off things for a while. Now he's trapped here, with no way to help Eden. It must be killing him. I clench the loose dirt under me and make as tight a fist as I can. If only the hospital had cures. Moments later, I see Mom walk across the room and sit at the edge of Eden's bed. Her hands are all bandaged up again. She murmurs something comforting to him and leans over to brush his hair from his face. I close my eyes. In my mind, I conjure up a memory of her face, soft and beautiful and concerned, her eyes bright blue and her mo mouth rosy and smiling. My mother used to tuck me in, smoothing down my blankets and whispering a promise of good dreams. I wonder what she's whispering to Eden now. Suddenly, I'm overwhelmed with missing her. I want to rush out from under here and knock on our door. I push my fists harder into the dirt. No, the risk is too great. I'll find a way to save you, Eden, I promise. I curse myself for risking so much money in a skiz bet instead of finding a more reliable way to get cash. I pull out the sea daisies that I had tucked into my shirt sleeve. Some of the blossoms are crumpled now, but I prop them up as carefully as I can and gently pat down dirt around them. I will probably never see them here, but I know they're here. The flowers are proof to myself that I'm still alive, still watching over them. Something red in the dirt beside the daisies catches my eye. I frown, then brush aside more of the dirt to get a better look. There's a symbol here, something inscribed underneath all the dirt and pebbles. It's a number, just like Tess and I had seen by the bank of the lake, except this time it says 2544. I used to hide down here sometimes when I was younger, back when my brothers and I would play hide-and-seek, but I don't remember seeing this before. I lean down and put my ear to the ground. At first there's nothing. Then I hear a faint sound, a whoosh, then a hissing and a gurgling, like some sort of liquid or steam. It's probably a whole system of pipes down there, something that leads all the way out to the lake, maybe all around the sector. I brush aside more dirt, but no other symbols or words appear. The number looks faded with age, the paint chipped away in little flakes. I stay there for a while, quietly studying it. I glance one last time through the vent of the bedroom, then make my way out onto the porch, into the shadows, and away into the city.